The universe always settles the score, and the only thing we can really be sure of in this world is the existence of cause and effect. Everything else is just kind of temporal. And that's the scientific revelation, is it not cause and effect? We realize things are connected. And we've been deeply out of line with nature, specifically since the Industrial Revolution, 200 years ago, like children playing with blocks, given all these options. But we haven't understood at all what we've been doing. And we're at pretty much a crossroad now, I would say. It's do or die. Either we adapt to the natural laws, the scientific principles that we've come to understand that orient not only human nature, our public health, epidemiology, but also the habitat. And that's really, I think, to me, what the core of the Zeitgeist Movement is about. And this view is structuralism. Structuralism is kind of a Gandhian concept. Johann Goltung, he's a, the president of the Gandhi Institute, he writes really eloquently about Gandhi and Gandhi's view that you really can't blame people. It's such a beautifully compassionate view. You can't blame people for things that are structurally incentivized. So he saw colonialism as a structure, and the people that were perpetuating colonialism were working kind of like agents of that structure. And it creates a beautiful kind of compassion when you start to think that way. You get rid of that in-group, out-group stuff that unfortunately continues to plague us, build xenophobia, racism, and general bigotry, and so on. Even people that hate the rich, which there's plenty of reason to do so at a certain, on a certain level, it still doesn't apply. They're still victims of all of this in the structural sense. And in terms of the most core influence of our structure, or our society, I should say, the social system is at the top. It's what creates the social psychology of who we are. There is the human nature aspect, the evolutionary psychology, the baggage of millions and millions of years of, of our evolution, our lower reptilian reactions. We're still stuck in that world because, guess what, the social system rewards it. And that's why we can't seem to bounce out of it and have more empathic and compassionate views. This is the biopsychosocial chart that I think is fairly common out there. It defines the individual health and ultimately public health of a society. I'm not going to belabor the points too much, but it's really epidemiology that everything's about. That's the ultimate measure. It's not wealth. It's how good you feel, how happy you are. It's not even lifespan. It's really the quality of the moments that we share. This chart, as intimidating as it may look, even to me, is an attempt to try and organize the structural relevance of the market and how it creates an incentive structure, how it creates institutions, and how it creates socioeconomic inequality and environmental disregard. I kind of put environmental disregard in the umbrella of socioeconomic inequality because guess what? The Earth doesn't really care about us. The Earth isn't going to be hurt by anything that we do in the sense of the Earth decaying. It will renew itself after our species blows up, if that's the way we end up. So it's really about us and our public health. How are we engaging with the Earth? And at the very end of this, it's a culmination of reduced mental, physical health, and ultimately lifespan reduction, too, to a certain degree, which is happening all around the world right now. No one's talking about it. Even in America, we have states with reduced lifespans occurring, which means we're hitting the tip of a bell curve of our immaturity, and things are now sliding in the other direction and all this talk of progress, and I'll touch upon the, some of those myths a little bit later on, and reduce social stability and increase violence, from gangs to terrorism to people now that will be able to blow things up with micro-technologies, nanotechnologies that will have more destructive power than suitcase bombs and nuclear proliferation, all the history of destruction. It's just going to get smaller and more powerful, and we are all at risk of the one individual, the one alienated group, and that's why you can no longer have just a pure self-interest worldview anymore. It has to be a social interest. Self-interest and social interest are intertwined more than either, any other time in human history because of the advancement of technology. This is fun because it shows the path through about 13,000 years of evolution, well, 13,000 years of history, economic evolution, that has created what we formally call capitalism. We went from monarchs to capitalism Feudalistic monarchs is probably the first early recognition of an economic system post the Neolithic Revolution, which is what changed effectively everything. And since that time, the past 13,000 years, there really hasn't been any variance of the root socioeconomic orientation. It's an obfuscation of power now. You know, the free market pretends it's, a, it's an issue of, of democracy, but it's really an issue of social control, just like it was back in feudal times. The invisible hand has groomed into neoliberalism, this global phenomenon where countries get sanctioned with austerity if they don't adhere to the freedom and democracy of markets. 
it's a globalization neoliberalism, in fact, that is, that is the correct terminology. Merchant trade, simple handicraft industries. You know, people way back in Adam Smith's time, they sat there and they traded. It was a very fundamental thing. It was required, it was needed, and it was purposeful. Now it's evolved to a point where you have financialization, people trading stocks, they, trading financial assets that don't exist, trading things literally just for the sake of trade, absolutely no utility whatsoever. It's the abstraction become reality. Low impact industry, we couldn't possibly be unsustainable in the past because we didn't have the technological means to do so. So we, we blindly started to engineer technology, the industrial revolution, and we didn't stop to think about our impact. Now we have one of the most unsustainable global patterns, uh, obviously, in human history. There's a conservative ethic. There's a puritanical kind of native aboriginal quality that you find throughout the entire world, and they wanted to be in harmony with nature. It was about coexistence. That's been destroyed. Now we have consumerism and materialism. Why? Because the social psychology of the market, what the market manifests in terms of incentive, has propagated and culminated this new value system. And people are born into it now. <clears throat> and they don't even know why they have these values. It's just what the system is and how the social interaction has evolved. And human labor to uh, machine labor. And that's the biggest contradiction of capitalism we have now. We will have cost efficiency where corporations are going to stop using humans because it's simply too cheap to use automation. And there you have you know, the ultimate foundation of the system falling out. Because if people can't get jobs, obviously they can't get money, they can't perpetuate cyclical, cyclical consumption. Now, if you read the United Nations World Economic Forum, um, if you read the uh, World Trade Organization statistics and the World Bank and all of these big macro, essentially neoliberal institutions, they'll tell you the world's getting better. But what they don't tell you are the trajectories that are contradicting this bell curve, as I just mentioned, that no nothing is getting better. Every life support system is in decline. In fact, I'll go through the top to bottom really briefly. Biodiversity loss is rampant, and every single major study that has come out, independent study, has pointed out that there has been absolutely no decline in the destruction of Earth ecosystems. Every single life support is in the red or in decline. General pollution, obviously the air pollution, climate change, which is the next one, but also land and ocean pollution. I'm sure you've read a bit about how the oceans are effectively decaying. 25 million year coral reef has just died. Fish populations have halved. And the oceans are so intrinsic to the basic sustainability of this planet and the synergies that create the balance that we see, which leads us, of course, to climate change. That is just as problematic, which I won't even belabor that one either. Water scarcity, food scarcity, all of those things are synergistic to this problem. We have to double our food supply by 2060. That's not going to happen based on current methods. There are, I was, you know, it's interesting the Western egoism. When you see the collapse, uh, the, the attacks in Mosul, and there's people buried, hundreds of them, under, under rubble. When you see the, the numerous people that recently died off the coast of the Mediterranean, the refugees, because they're trying to get out. And yet, a couple people die in London. And it's all plastered terrorism, this white imperial self-indulgence. And, and when it comes to, when it comes to the, uh, the news that you see, excuse me, I, I was watching this thing unfold, as sad as it is, and on the bottom of the scroll on the news, it says, oh yeah, one billion people without clean water. And I'm like, wow, that little blip, huh. Amongst all the media fanfare, the terrorism. So where are our priorities? It's really quite disgusting. And government debt. Well, technological unemployment, I think we all got that. I mentioned that. Government debt, 60% of all countries will be bankrupt by 2050. Now, that's a customary fiction. Big empires, the United States, China, Russia, they don't really have to respect their debt. It's effectively socialism for the rich and free markets for the poor. It's smaller countries that suffer the austerity and the world bank loans and the structural adjustments because of their debt liability, which is effectively a form of slavery and geopolitical coercion. These five attributes are the transition points as far as I'm concerned. Automation, access, open source, localization, digital feedback. These are not new ideas. They're all showing their merit as time goes on in every single economic capacity. Automation is clear. Access, you see the rise of the sharing economy. You see people using Uber and, and couch surfing and things like that. We have people slowly inch, inching into tool libraries. 
that is slowly becoming a fad, a trend, which is good. It's not really authentic, but it's still good. If everyone used, say, an Uber or a car sharing system deliberately, then you would see a reduction of pollution, a reduction of car use, easier parking, and so on. So there is that good trend. But that's the trend that you have to follow. That's what proves that this is, has efficacy. Open source, the move from corporate boardrooms to open source. Open source has proven to be 10 times more productive if you have the infrastructure to get people to collaborate in a strategic way. You know, there are some psychologists that have argued that you can't have mass incorporation because it's that too many cooks in the kitchen phenomenon and you lose focus. But if you have the right infrastructure for it, there's no reason you can't open source every type of design, even a, building a car, building a computer, CAD, you know, computer, engineer, computer, computer aided engineering. These things are what the future holds as corporate America will, hopefully will die because this is the abundance producing mechanism, the, the equity generating mechanism which leads to localization. Localization could emerge out of, global, out of globalization because it could be, become more cheaper. That term ephemeralization from Buckminster Fuller that says we're doing more and more and more with less and less and less. Things are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more compact and more powerful and less uh, energy intensive and so on, less labor intensive. If that continues, it's not out of the question in say 15, 20 years time, in fact I bank on it, that a whole country could go off the grid. A whole city could go off the grid. They localize everything and produce right there. And I think that's, a, that's what should be aspired to, obviously, for multiple reasons, as with all of these. But these are the trends. And digital network feedback, also known as the Internet of Things, rather than connecting your refrigerator or your toaster to the Internet, which I still can't quite figure out why people are doing this, you could actually have whole amounts of information. You know, I, we have the Brisbane Wi-Fi. It's, uh, it's getting there. Imagine the whole city with Wi-Fi, with smart sensors connected to all transactions, technical transactions, not monetary transactions you could have immense feedback that completely debunks the idea that you have to have markets to generate consumer preference and all those things by Ludwig von Mises and these socialist arguments that go back a long time that say without money you just don't have the dynamic. Actually the price mechanism is one of the oldest and slowest things you have and the true future of, of cataloging and accounting I should say of an economy will be this, even in a monetary economy they, they're doing this now. But it goes to show the power of it. Those are to me, if any of those can be pushed forward, the, the result will be proportional to how far you get. And obviously you're going to run up against uh, the system. It's going to reduce scarcity, it's going to reduce inequality, and it's going to increase sustainability. Now I'm going to read this for you. Uh, this is sort of this train of thought. These are the, the recognitions that as far as I'm concerned are most important as a train of thought. The structuralist realization that the most detrimental social patterns existing today are sourced to a flawed economic orientation. This, unfortunately, is still it's oblivion to the minds of most of the intelligentsia in the world. They refuse to acknowledge it. It's blatant, but it's, it's, that's it. That's the first one. These resulting detrimental social patterns include socioeconomic inequality as the core public health threat, as I expanded upon before. Socioeconomic inequality is the precondition for a spectrum of other problems also linking to unsustainable negative externalities produced by the market. I don't, you know, I don't know if you saw this study that they analyzed all the corporations uh, in the world, in fact, and they found that none of them are profitable. When you take into account negative externalities, meaning the pollution that's created, meaning the long-term repercussions that humanity has to fix, then none of them are profitable. Isn't that not astounding? It's nuts. Like, we don't even account for the negative externalities. And that's profound. Adjusting away from this flawed economic orientation and seeking to reduce socioeconomic inequality and generate environmental sustainability means shifting focus to maximize economic efficiency through strategic systems-based technical design. <laughs> this will reduce scarcity, reduce inequality, and reduce environmental footprint. It will also better harness ephemeralization, moving us closer to this post-scarcity abundance that we've been talking about for years. Now, accomplishing this transition will require both creative initiative and activist initiative, and that one is the real laws. We understand the creative initiative. We understand we need think tanks. We need people to get together and start to work with those five attributes I talked about. Create new infrastructures online where people can engage in good design through a completely participatory economic democracy rather than what we have now. The creative initiative has to do with developing the efficiency enhancing systems that will compose the new economic mode. The activist initiative has to do with strategic pressure and demands placed upon the existing power structure coercing change from the bottom up. Because I'm sorry to say, none of this is going to happen without a fight. The system of capitalism is a system of social control. It has its merits. Technology has made it seem okay. 
But those that have been around for literally thousands of years, the, the, the faceless hierarchical 1%, so to speak, the ones that continually preserve that element of the system that keeps them above everybody else that has not changed. And it's not going to change without a unified interest. And this leads me to effectively my last slide. You know, I've spent a long time trying to talk to people that, first you're in the system, maybe a family or something, you know, you don't want to rock the boat. You have your own concerns. You have, to, you have to just stay healthy and so on. You can understand why people are backed into a corner and why this kind of transition is so difficult. And then, are those, then there are those that just are so brainwashed. They, they have such... Uh, an uh, anti-socialist disposition. They, they have such a core value orientation to the system that you just can't get through to them. And they're effectively, they, they don't know enough. They, they're ignorant. And then there are those that should know better. The techno-capitalist apologists, the people that have done well in their entrepreneurialism. They refer to themselves as social entrepreneurs or green entrepreneurs. They, they investigate and they talk about high technology. The Ray Kurzweil's, the Peter Diamandis's, the Jeremy Rifkin's, in fact, whom I love. I love all these guys. The Steven Pinkers, who try to tell you that the world just keeps getting better, and oh, it's just these negative people that are dissatisfied. There are 46 million slaves in the world right now. Some of them passed through generations. There's still feudalism in Asia. There's the measure of what creates future success as a species means you have to hold on to these patterns of development that are creating better social justice equity and uh, sustainability, and all those trends are now in question. So it bothers me tremendously when I, when I hear this uh, fraudulent green capitalism stuff or, or this kind of weird passive pussyfooting around that we should be somewhat complacent with corporations and use them to our advantage. Obviously, we have to use them to our advantage to some degree. The very fact that we're here is based on a monetary architecture, the fact I have a computer, all of this means we're participating in the system, obviously. But if you don't acknowledge that the system is fundamentally violent, that the system is an archaic social control system that has benefited with the illusion of technology's efficiency to make it seem like everything is getting better, ignoring all the vast destruction in its wake, then there's a serious problem. Okay, my first question, let's get into it. Okay, so in your presentation you said it won't happen without a fight. And I'm trying to find uh, this, uh, this connection here when you say that. And then I watch the Interreflections trailer. <laughs> and I look at this, uh, uh, what you're creating here in terms of, uh, uh, I guess, a way to fight. Maybe, no? I'll let you answer that. Don't confuse the gesture of the trailer with anything that I would propose. I'm trying to build on memes that are culturally unique, such as WikiLeaks, Anonymous, so that element of the trailer where you have this rise of Concordia, which I'm using as a symbol, in a very symbol, sim similar way than you see like the V for Vendetta masks, that's why I plaster that symbol all over the trailer. And when I build the website and such, I'm actually gonna imitate this subculture. And I'm hoping to spark kind of an association to a symbology as opposed to an organization or a group. Because after a decade of working with the movement, you, s you meet people that they, again, they identify with it, but they don't really wanna be group inclusive. Like they feel, they just don't feel comfortable with that. So I've learned that and I want to create a symbology that people can take with them. In terms of the trail, excuse me, in terms of you know, the issue of a fight, you know, Frederick Douglass has this great quote that the, whatever people are willing to tolerate in terms of their oppression is the exact amount of oppression they're going to consistently get. Meaning that we've become so complacent and with these assumptions and if you, without, you know, uh, Slavery and apartheid and all of these massive economic shifts did not happen with peaceful, peaceful conversation, or I should say, did not happen with conversations where rational thought was being applied. And when you have a system of social control like this, in the wake of all of this great potential, I don't promote violence or anything like that, but it's, I fear for the day, and I apologize for the fragmented thinking, I fear for the day, both, but both long for it, when the society finally realizes the structural violence against them the millions and millions, tens of billions, ultimately, of people that are suffering and they think it's their fault. And once they realize that it isn't, well, I can't be held accountable for when that happens <laughs> because I think it's not gonna be pretty, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you have to get in the street and it has to be a bloody revolution, French revolution, nothing like that. If there is a galvanized critical mass, then that will end it. If you can get all the environmental, the social justice, the the uh, even animal rights, anything. Everyone that's working for any kind of social justice on all levels, if it has a structural relationship to the market's phenomenon, which most everything does, get them galvanized in this direction, then it's over. 
which is you know, why the movement's original intent was to create the largest critical mass possible. And I really believe that. You know, the state doesn't have enough resources to, get, to take out the states to take out the entire public. It's just the fact that fragmentation is persistent. And you go back to FBI, CIA works with Martin Luther King, all they did consistently during the, the, the most potent civil rights revolution in America was constantly divide and implant people to create division. And it's a, it's a shame, too, in the movement where you get people get up in arms, they get egotistical, and you end up with conflicts within the movement. And that's a shame, too. It, it, that persists both in our, our ego neuroses, but it's also a natural uh, uh, defense of the establishment to keep things fragmented. That's why in America you have this mass polarization now. You have this alt-right now. You know, where did that come from? This, people are so polarized, they go to the internet and they look for only information that supports their worldview. And we have one of the most divided cultures in America probably ever since probably the Civil War or so when you look at the people's politics. And that's terrible. So we're just running in place. You know, there's no progress going to happen there for a long time because we can't unify with a common direction. So I hope that helps. So this one's from Simon Cole, who is also a friend of mine and uh, sitting somewhere here. Oh, there he is with his hand up there. You all right for me to read your question, Simon? Yeah. <laughs> okay, he says, I sense that managing the movement is not your thing. Am I right? If so, what are your thoughts <laughs> about putting people with high level experience in place? Love your artwork, by the way, kiss, kiss, hug, hug. Thank you. Oh, I would love nothing more than to put people that have more patience than I do, more social experience or more, uh, or I I'm an introvert believe it or not. So I have a hard time when it comes to group conflict or just trying to be you know, communicative and resolve problems, which is why I pretty much bowed out years ago when it came to ch chapter organization and the really social attribute and problem solving, excuse me, uh, resolving conflicts within the movement. There's always something, as I said before, it's, it's a kind of a scarce, a scarcity foundation movement. And we didn't start the NPO, for example, until last year. So it's pretty much nine years of complete and pure grassroots. And the fact that it worked at all that to this point is actually quite amazing. So if I knew of people that stepped up that had better organizational skills and they had the exact same alignment of the movement, I'd hope that'd be a natural phenomenon. So I mean, I've, you know, it's, so don't think I sit back. In fact, I'm, I've probably done a disservice to the movement over the years by not trying to help manage more. And it's been this self-development and I've kind of appreciated that on one side, but I see the flaws to, to a lack of organization. We've learned our lesson to a certain degree. So the NPO is trying its best to talk to all the coordinators of the movement and get more of a think, ta think tank type of approach and, and simplify, in fact, the way we communicate and the way we organize. Uh, we obviously are centric to the events and stuff. That's a big part of it. But uh, I don't want to go on a tangent. But yeah, I, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> An overwhelming yes uh, for those that feel that they have, uh, and can do it, of course, as in a volunteer context. And therein lies one of the great problems. You know, we all like to volunteer. We all, so many people volunteer, but it, it has to be fragmented because we have to survive, and effectively, time is money in this society. So there's always that threshold of what people can do. And um, sorry, I'll just speak on that too. I mean, as as a coordinator, um, I, I think that not just looking up to someone for answers, not just looking up to authority, which is something that we're constantly, you know, fed, that we just need to try and search for, to someone else for, look to someone else for answers, um, but we need to, to find that power within ourselves. And that's all I do as coordinators. So I, I think we personally shouldn't see Peter as like the guy with all of the answers and someone who has to organise everything. So we need to find that within ourselves. I mean, we have been described as a leaderless movement. Um, and when I, I, like, I like to call it leaderful movement. <laughs> and we can all be empowered. I'll, I'll say one more thing. It's really about the structure. I, Occupy was such an amazing outburst. But if you look at what's happened to Occupy, because it, it had a lack of focal point and there was a general lack of structure. It's gotten, they've changed, of course. They have a nonprofit too and they've, they've, they've reacclimated a bit. But you, everyone you know, complained about the potential that was lost during that. And I think it's because it's so difficult. It's such a difficult thing to galvanize people from all these disparate backgrounds that share a little bit of a common view, but the moment you get them all together, you have, to have a, you have to have an accepted infrastructure that people want to be a part of. So we know we have Z Days, we have the Media Festival. If people know that the structure is there, it should be a self-fulfilling prophecy. They should, the logic should be there uh, in the, the, to the extent that no one has to sit there and send out emails telling people what to do or the like. So I'm hoping that that gets perfected as the movement progresses in terms of the structure. 
first question from the crowd. Are you rich? Me? Yeah, why not? That's good. Uh, okay, so I kind of wanted to ask a bit about the alt-right phenomenon and uh, particularly opposition to it. It seems to me that the alt-right phenomenon is largely a product of a lot of people sensing that there's something not right in the structural way the world is, or the way the world is set up. And as a result, they look for scapegoat and Trump and Brexit and all that provide that. But what's really interesting to me is resistance to it because I work with a lot of people in the social justice community who work for racial equality, gender equality, what have you, and they're always sort of battling the alt-right, which I think is important. But when I try to start talking about things structurally and saying, you know, we should look at what created the alt-right and the, the economic and social conditions that gave rise to this, Sometimes I get a kind of like raised eyebrow approach, like, you know, oh, are you just spending a conspiracy or something like that? So I'm wondering if you have any advice for how to bring people from other forms of activism into uh, the view where we, they sort of accept this structural train of thought. Well, I would probably say the alt-right, of course, that's a, that's unfortunate we have to use that label because it's actually a very diverse subculture, but it's the farthest extreme it's definitely the farthest from the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, so how would you approach folks like that? That's a very good question because that phenomenon really is echoes of the precursors of fascism. It's people that have so much xenophobic fear. They think groups are oppressing them in ways that have no structural relationship. They think they get these people in power. They have massive distrust that has kernels of truth in it, by the way. So if, you're, if I understand your question, Rich. I, there's a slight difference. I'm asking how do we... Sorry. Sorry. The, the question I'm asking is that I, I, there's a lot of unification around people who are opposing the alt-right. I see. But I want to know how those people who are opposing, they don't always see the structural lens, and I'm trying to see Which how is, I can do it. So yeah. in the sense of, say, the left that is yeah. in, in horror of this new Trump cult of personality subculture, right? Right. How do you talk to them? Yeah. Uh, see, they're so, again, it's still such a xenophobic in-group, out-group phenomenon. The threat is now the group of the alt-right. So they don't, they don't see the culmination through time, the structuralism, the fear, the poverty. You know, the, in the Midwest of America, you have extremely low literacy rates still. So that culmination of things, so the answer to your question is I don't really know how to answer it, to the effect that it's, it's uh, if you can create common ground and you can get them to see that there are structural ramifications, see, I think you've already, you already know the answer. <laughs> I think. You already know the answer. I could tell by the way you phrased it. And if you can get common ground, and if you can get people to see that their deprivation is not linked to some group, but a chain reaction that goes back a long way of people preserving a system of oppression, mm -hmm. then that would be the best ticket. But that's also, you know, good luck with that. Okay. Is that's, that's the conflict that we have with everything, ultimately. That's, that's the problem that we're faced with any kind of communication out there, is they, people just are too groupistic. Their, their, their social psychology is so group-oriented that they think it's always versus, 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 and they can't rationalize because they haven't been taught how to think in terms of systems and complexity. They can't see how they're a product of something, and many of them don't want to because of that general narcissism, that, that human fallacy that we think we're individual and separate and special. And it's so it's a very unromantic detour to look at yourself as an outcome of a society, an outcome of a process. You know, that's, that's a natural law scientific view, but how long has that been with us? Maybe oh. since the Enlightenment, barely since the Enlightenment, have even, people have even had the conscience of, I mean, uh, sociology really wasn't even an idea until Marx came along. As a, it really didn't, no one even thought about sociology in that sense. He's, he put it right on the map, a couple with Weber and some other people. Anyway, I hope that helps. Thank you. Okay, you know, I'm sorry to... Uh, push Sonny in, but I think I might get Sonny's question first because I've actually got his question here. But if you'd like to ask it yourself, Sonny, that might be better. The trailer inspired me to ask another question, so it's oh, about the trailer. Just one. No. Just one. Okay, <laughs> you can skip mine over there. Fair enough. Um, like looking at that seems like a a story with sort of a, a worldview and an ideology meant to inspire people. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the good person version of Ayn Rand that inspired people to like hate that's, the poor, that's love a great, themselves. That's a great parallel, actually. I like that you said that. There's a very specific subtext to Ayn Rand, too, but I won't go into that. Um, but yeah, like, is that is that one of the aspirations, sort of trying to, you know, do the similar hack to society that she did? 
uh, just uh, you could you could argue that. In fact, by the end of the manner. trilogy, because remember, it, it's it moves through three films. It's one big film, but it will be divided into three for a number of different reasons. And I don't want to give too much of a way of how it's going to unfold because there's an abstraction to it. But I'll put it this way: by the end of the trilogy, it is the opposite of the Ayn Rand revolution. It, it takes the same foundation of her her ideas in the sense of collectivism being the enemy in her view, of course, collectivism and everyone's a number, there's no individuality, you know, it's that state of, of hierarchical oppression since capitalism wasn't allowed to flourish in this free market state. These are the people that have guns. These are the people that values are fundamentally to the right. These are the people that want to preserve their in-group. That is effectively what her view has created, whether she intended it or not. And in the future, at the end of this trilogy, the world has transformed, but only in part. There's still conflict, and the terrorists of the future are the free market advocates of today. And I put that in a very unique arc throughout the whole film. I'm not gonna express too much because that's what she did. She did it with the collectivist propaganda. Yeah. See, I'm not putting this in the sense of literalism. There's, a, there's an undertone of documentary to it, it's mixed genre, but it, it has a unique abstraction and I'm, I'm actually very very uh, excited because I don't think anyone will ever have seen anything like it. And it either will, some will love it, some will hate it, most will probably either love or hate it. But uh, yeah, so I don't want to belabor it. That's that's a very good intuition that you just had. Yeah. All right, Ziggy. Okay. Um, uh, it can be argued that um, science is uh, the tool that will propel uh, humanity forward. Um, however, in in the in the cu current paradigm or the current zeitgeist. Um, science is a subservient to the anti-science mentality. So the, 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 uh, the growth of, of the market today uh, is built upon um, the, the wants and desires of people that are mainly at their core anti-science. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, academia, which is very powerful for certain things, like CERN, which is the, the, the most, possibly the most expensive uh, enterprise ever conducted by humankind. Um, but it's niche. It's niche in NASA, in CERN, here and there. And um, my question is, how are we appealing to the most powerful people that can um, help us uh, come through and uh, enrich this uh, anti-science movement that is currently today uh, ruling the, the United States and possibly many other countries. You use the word enrich, do you mean try to make them evolve? Is that what you're saying? So you want to you get them to see the errors of their ways, those that have a narrow scientific view, if I understand it correct, correctly. Um, I won't say the errors of their ways, but there is a potential uh, in, well, what, what we're doing is using the, the, the tools of the, sci uh, the methods of science for, for human concern, which is what we are not um, taking advantage of in our current zeitgeist. Yeah. So um, we are appealing to the, the general public um, I think in, I, in, in the same I think way, I what you're saying. we're a, not appealing specifically sure. to academia, which is kind of in tune with oh, us. Oh, yeah. One of the great disappointments I have when you look at the scientific community, especially those that have a bit of fame, such as, oh, I don't know, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or um, all these kind of people that sort of promote a Carl Sagan unified science field. Someone, you know, Carl is one of the few out there that really brought it to a social level. Or some of the folks you know that I talked to in Zeitgeist Moving Forward, brilliant people, but they're locked into their own in-group world. They have tenures, they have jobs, they have reputations, and they don't want to be associated with anything that can jeopardize that. And I think it's also the general monetary incentive where people are rewarded over time. You know, these poor scientists have worked so hard to get where they are, they don't want to rock the boat. And whether they're intelligent enough to know it or not, their social psychology has changed. I very rarely run into anyone with a, with a great scientific mind. Probably the closest person right now is Stephen Hawking, because Hawking is so irregular. Hawking pretty much has diagnosed the system in the exact same way we have. You know, he's gotten to the point of high cynicism, though, that he doesn't think there's a, there's a solution. 
He thinks we have to get off this planet to continue the species because we're just going to destroy it, and that's that. You know, he's talked about technological unemployment. It makes it very clear that if we don't adjust and create safeguards and capitalism, then it, the technological capacity or abundance capacity is just going to create more inequality. It's not going to help more people rise above maybe slight percentages versus the tremendous uh, absorption, which is where the efficiency of technology went. So to answer your question, that's a good one. I, I think uh, there's a, I'm disappointed by the general scientific community that they don't take more of a social disposition. And I wish I, I could tell you how to approach that. I'd hope they would just sort of realize it over time. But I will say one thing about you. So you said we're using the, the method of science. It's more accurate to say at this point we're using the evidence of science. The public health evidence that we see that links us to the environment, that, that we know inequality is bad for us. It's like a clock, toxic cloud. There's no longer a defense of this hierarchy of social dominance and these old world views, because I've researched this for years. There's really an enormous amount of, of research, bad science, that they say humans are just wired for hierarchy and stability in society comes from the dominant class maintaining their dominance and everyone else believing in the values of the dominant class. It's called social dominance theory. It's widespread, it goes back hundreds of years and it's very kernel uh, a disposition. And with all that bad stuff still filtering around, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer for you. All I can say is that those that, that have a social conscience will hopefully will eventually come forward and run a little bit of a risk. Like someone like Robert Sapolsky from Stanford, if you listen to his interviews, he's, he's the closest one that really gets on the edge of it. Like he just threatens to say something really controversial, but he's just not quite there and he always backs up a little bit. I think in their private conversations, guys like that really do know what's going on. But they have families. They have, they, again, they, have, they, need, they need their work and um, it's unfortunately a, still a fringe concept to even discuss anything that's outside of the market and what it's doing. So, hope that helps. All right. You can just go. Okay, next. Hi, my name's Matthew. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Peter. Oh. Um, you opened my eyes a long time ago. Enough of that. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, I'm trying to articulate this well, because everyone else has been so articulate. Um, I see the movement's been a very advertised-based movement from my eyes. It's been a lot of um, talk about spreading the word, and, and I think that's been great so far, but it seems to me that we may have reached the peak of the people that we're going to reach um, with spreading the word. There's just so many people that I just know in myself that I'm resistant to media. Um, we get bombarded with it every day and someone else's insights and someone else's views being posed to you. Um, and the people that have taken it on have taken it on and, and are running with it and you guys have done great work. Um, but I feel I would like your thoughts on... Well, here's what I would say. Those of us, if there's, there's that tendency to want to see a quantitative change. Yep. And I, we're all like that and we're wired to think that way. And our group psychology is such that if we see group interest diminish, our nervous system responds to want to also diminish. You know what I mean by that? Yep. We have a, a general natural groupistic wired behavior that in large masses we gravitate towards what the big masses are doing and we shy away towards what seems to be again fringe and less socially acceptable. Yep. There is literally a dopamine reaction in our system. There's a Russian scientist, I, I wrote about it recently, that expressed that when you deviate from the group opinion, meaning like you, the mass media or the mainstream values, you cause actual physical pain and your body doesn't like doing that. So it's really fascinating. You can overcome it through you know, being aware of it and, of course, training, and eventually that reaction will subside, but it is uh, unfortunately built somewhat into our evolutionary psychology based on this guy's research. We have to do it one way or another. If there are two people in this room, it doesn't change the motivation. Sure. It, 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 what else are you going to do? I mean, just ignore it? So are there other organizations that are somehow better? If there were, I would join them. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not here in an egotistical, I don't identify with the movement as a symbol. I sure. see it as a, hopefully a galvanization towards progress. It's, I don't, there's unfortunately a materialistic sense. I talk to people, like, oh, the movement, we've lost chapters, and blah, blah, blah. Well, oh well, doesn't change the motivation. What else are you going to do? Are you going to stop complaining or are you going to actually go and try to do something to help something move forward because there's really no choice? It's either this or it's something else. And all I can hope, what I will say, though, is that there have been many, I don't want, I wouldn't call them offshoots, but a lot of beautiful organizations that have arisen in small pockets with certain focuses, whether it be automation or open source. And, and they weren't there 10 years ago. 
And I think the movement has had an influence, and I think we should pay attention to that. I would say in terms of the influence of the values, we actually have grown quite a bit. They, it might not be under the umbrella of the Zeitgeist movement, but it's certainly developing. So my actual question was... Um, oh, sorry. I, <laughs> that was just the preface. Um, <laughs> Should we not be focusing on a more hands-on um, showing people the way by? That takes money. Yeah, sure it does. But we've got a lot of people here that have hands. Yeah. They've got skills. I agree with They've that. Got... And the volunteer, well, our new website, as mentioned by Gilbert, is going to have a whole section to try and galvanize people with different skills. Something we've actually, there was an offshoot website called Zeitgeist Resources years ago, and they started doing that, but it, like many things, it faltered. Uh, the, set, the site went down and, and you know, things being what they are, it was never picked back up and there was data lost and so on and so forth. That's a big part of it. I completely agree. There need to be think tanks. The next stage of the movement, if we had, if we had the interest, well, excuse me, if we had the, well, yeah, the interest of people to join together and galvanize would be think tanks that focus on those five points I just talked about. Like I talked about this thing called the Global Redesign Institute, and it's an attempt to create a platform of participatory, participatory economics that incorporates CAD and computer-aided design, get programmers in, and actually show how you can, can, you can create anything through open source and integrated systems like computer-aided design. Like that's a, if, if we could show the public that, or show economic calculation processes, like at the end of the Zeitgeist Movement Defined, if you can create that algorithmic structure, and even in corporate America, these people are so pressured on some level, even though it's blindly overlooked and that they circumvent it constantly, but if they want to be ecologically sustainable, they could pipe in a similar algorithm just for their own internal industries to make sure what they're doing is actually sustainable for the planet. I'm not saying they would, but it could be one of those things that could catch on, at least maybe for startups and stuff like that, to set new precedents. Does that make sense? I'm talking about things on a much more simple level. There's simple things. Give me an example. Can, things we can do to uplift our communities, um, community gardens. Tool banks. In Toronto, um, they have shared tool banks. Tool libraries. Love Ex that. Oh, time like banks, that. mutual credit systems. Long ago, we talked about mutual credit systems where people exchange without money. To, and they've, this stuff's become more sophisticated. I believe in Europe there's a really sophisticated program they put forward. I can't remember the name of them right now, unfortunately. But they were able to qualify or quantify uh, the difference between someone mowing your lawn and somebody fixing, say, a computer bug. And they, were, they made an exchange system that would that without money. And that's amazing. Not only does that help alleviate people that don't have the resources financially but do have a skill that they can, they can barter, essentially, but it also eliminates the cyclical consumption. And it forces this slowing of growth, which makes people more aware of the problem. I think if we can put a few of those projects um, into play, and we... I've been talking we, about it for years, and I always... We give away whatever we make for free, food, and so yeah. on. It undermines the capitalist system, as well as shows people the way, and shows that we have good intent. We're not just yeah. trying to shove our points Oh, if someone had the resources their... to invest in a, in a Zeitgeist time bank and put together the, the structure, or, or a vertical farm under the name of Zeitgeist. I had this fantasy of doing, uh, in, in Los Angeles, I, I don't have any investors or anything, but it did strike me. What if you had the Z bar, and it's fully automated bar? just to show that it can be done. Now, they're in San Francisco, they have a few little small things like that, but you set the precedent. Now, that's not a community idea, that's more of a communicative idea, but if, when someone finally puts forward the first automated restaurant or bar, it will set the new precedent and the trends will start to move forward to see, for people to realize that we can't have this labor for income system. That's a little bit more communicative to what you're saying, I understand. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just wanted to say actions speak louder than words. Oh, I agree. I, I can't be held accountable for, uh, for these things in the sense that people look to me, and I don't mean to, to insinuate that you do that, but people often blame me, which is why I've pushed back a lot as any kind of figurehead, because I've tried the best I can and plant as many seeds, but I can't, you know, there's no, the movement has to remain grassroots. If we did get a $10 million donation, well, then these kind of projects could probably be, be done in mass and we could figure stuff out, so. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to a question from the, Sorry. Notepad. That's okay. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on universal basic income? I've written and talked about uni universal basic income. I agree, lecture. I say it's basically the only answer the establishment has to try and circumvent the social destabilization that will be created from technological unemployment. So, it, and people, thank God, people like Elon Musk and other folks that have great clout are also talking about it. So, you know, that that is uh, something that I de definitely believe in. Not only would it elevate public health, 
uh, to the extent where you're going to be able to absorb, there'll be a little bit less of an interest for social destabilization because, you know, it, there's no better precursor for conflict than inequality and deprivation. That, that is a complete scientific sociological fact. The more you're exposed to it, the more you're inclined to violence and so on, which is why the United States is the biggest wealth gap of any industrialized nation and also has the most violence. So would you alleviate that, get everybody by the poverty line? In fact, my biggest influence of that was reading, of course, the work of Dr. Martin Luther King in 1967. They had the poverty movement that he was killed right before, and they were trying to pitch an economic bill of rights in the United States, and the first thing was give everybody universal minimum guaranteed income to elevate, it, uh, elevate them above the poverty line, and he knew that all the civil rights stuff wouldn't be half as effective if we didn't do this, and he was absolutely correct. The, the, the plight of African Americans has been one systemic unfolding of, of oppression because they're still stuck in grinding poverty and heavy inequality, and it's, that is the train that keeps moving forward from the abject slavery period, keeping all of that bigotry and racism uh, fomenting between the lower classes as they fight for resources and so on. So I, I believe in that wholeheartedly. Okay. Um, Mark, would you like to come up? And, and can I please ask you to uh, frame a question, not um, a comment like yesterday? That would be great. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah. I would like to remind, well, I think I've told you before, Peter, that uh, addendum completely changed my life. I. Uh, Quit my job, and I've been completely focused to, uh, you know, participating in a new system and creating a new system since. Um, so my question is, uh, just one, uh, if you could ask us all to do just one very specific, very simple action, what would it be? That's tough. See, the thing is, it's not an individual act that is going to make this transition. It's a galvanization and group force. So if there's any single act, it's finding, if everybody found one other person to join them in the movement, well, then it'd be all over. It would spread throughout. So you, yeah, I wish I could give you a clever, you know, answer, but it's not the internals, it's not the individual that, that's gonna make this happen in the sense that, you know, one person's gonna come up with a great idea. Um, it's really that galvanization. The individual is critical. I would say, I'll break it down to this though. If there's any one thing, it would be investigating attributes, especially if you're in college, that actually relate to something real. As someone myself who has been exposed and for I guess about 15 years of my life, I was in marketing, advertising, and Wall Street in the sense of trading, not on Wall Street. But I spent so many hours and years working with professional traders when I didn't care because that was the way I was I evolved as a narcissistic musician, and I didn't have a social conscience. It wasn't until years after, and I have been exposed to the worst of the worst when it comes to people's simple economic ignorance. And if anyone wants to do something productive, look into open source programming, look into robotics, look into all those great things that will eventually, artificial intelligence, that will be the foundation of the future. So I would say that as an educational imperative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Well, thank you so much for your effort for human species. I think we all appreciate everything you've done for everyone. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I think my question is a little bit complicated in the sense that, um, well, we know that the Zeitgeist movement is very scientific-based, right? And, um, but I believe sometimes the science has its flaws as well in a sense that, for example, this morning I was reading the article and they found out that, you know, the lungs has an important role in producing blood. Mm, I heard that. And I was like, wow, you know, it's 2017, we just found that out. You know what I mean? Well, or, or the, not to interrupt you, but or they, they found out that uh, fats are not, after all this nutrition information, fats are not the cause of heart disease and so on. Mm. The, the myths of cholesterol and so on. So, not to interrupt you anymore, but yeah. it, the, science is a development. Absolutely. It's one way a, a religious belief sort of thing, because they have to have faith in order to achieve something, and they do their techniques and find evidence, so on. Anyway, um, my question is, there's so much that we don't know of, especially in, a, in, a, in terms of consciousness, right? And at the same time, there's so many ancient traditions that have so much wisdom regarding 
consciousness and you know even ethiogenic plants as well and this reconnection to nature and so on. Um, my question is, how do you see the zeitgeist movement or the idea of the zeitgeist movement to um, connecting people to this inner wisdom that we all have, but we kind of like forgot about due to barriers to critical thinking and so on that you know culture develops and I don't know how do you see that um, this bit that we quite can't really comprehend. Um, I don't know, in terms of the future and so on. So if I understand your question correctly, it's with regard to kind of an internal awareness that you think has been lost? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Uh, something that we're quite not sure yet, but we all kind of know. And science can't really explain what it is, because well, we don't even know what consciousness is. Going back to native cultures, which is the only example I can think of, as an American, I've studied you know, Native American cultures, and to see that sense of coexistence, that, that respect for the habitat, and that, that back then, you know, this intuition of, of this interconnected causality and the oneness or whatever sim spiritual symbology people like to use. The nervous system, I think, has proven itself to show very clear characteristics of, of, of uh, distortion over the course of the past 200 years since industrialization and all the pollution of materialism and so on, which is why you have so much depression and anxiety, which is why people have all sorts of illnesses that they've never had before. There was just recently a study that an 80-year-old person in this one indigenous tribe, uh, I, believe it was, um, I believe it was in Latin America, they had better hearts than the average 50-year-old American because of, partially because of their diet, as they said, but also because of the stress. So I guess my point is that we will continue to react to the distortions of this system until we start to listen to what's actually happening. So if there is, if there is a natural wisdom, I'm not quite sure, but I know that the physiology will tell you if things are going well or not. And right now you have a very sick, emotionally sick culture. You have a physically, generally sick culture. We can, we can argue lifespans and stuff like that, but there's many, lifespans are being extended by medicine, applied medicine, not necessarily smart development of the human being. You know what I mean? So people are just sicker longer. So, <laughs> so you know, I, but back to the wisdom issue, I'm not, I, that's a great question. Is there anything internal? I don't, I'm not gonna, rhetorically speaking, I don't know. I don't know if there's a spiritual center in the human being that somehow is an, is an innate knowledge that we can meditate and touch into. I don't know if I believe that. I don't have enough evidence to show, but I do know that the nervous system and our brains have certain evolutionary wirings that expect certain things, and if they don't happen, or if bad things happen that shouldn't happen, then we are gonna become deformed. And if we pay attention to public health and epidemiology, then that path will continually become clear. And that's why inequality, which has been that long-standing myth for so long, this idea that we have to have hierarchy economically, uh, that is a myth. It, it makes us sick, it makes us angry and distorted. It makes us spiritually bankrupt. Martin Luther King had a phrase, the poverty of the spirit, and it's this materialistic phenomenon that we have become so detached you know, we're sending spaceships to the moon, but we can't even figure out how to feed people here. Uh, we can't even learn how to coexist. And I think that, that falls into that, into that category as well, this general mental illness that we call normality. I'm going to take a question from the booth. This one's from George James. Are you in the audience, George? There he is out there. Okay. He said... Peter, you gave a wonderful presentation a few years ago called Art Science Alloys. At the end, you quoted Rumi, destroy your reputation. Do you believe that? And could you please speak more to that? Thank you. Well, if reputation is a cultural bias, if it's a cultural measure, then it comes down to how intelligent the culture is. If reputation is about getting a job or being respected in your society, you know, if that's the case, then yeah, destroy your reputation because you're basically just aligning with a fundamentally slave and manipulative system. It's not that you actively do that because if, well, you have to survive, then clearly you're not going to go out and put on a big fake gorilla suit and run through the aisles of a grocery store and, and scream about... I'm sorry, I can't finish, finish that. <laughs> but you get the point. <laughs> so obviously, in this culture, sadly, we are, we are controlled by reputation. And that's really unfortunate. But if you really care, and if you're really honest with yourself, you'll find ways to break out of the norm and not fear for what other people think. If everyone orchestrated themselves without the fear of what other people think, the world would be, would be such a better place. But because of the monetary scarcity, 
we are locked in. That's why, again, going back to the scientist question and all these great thinkers, the intelligentsia, that's why they won't rock the boat, even though they have the capacity to really change things dramatically if they had the courage to do so. Hi, Peter. Uh, Siggy triggered a question, uh, Siggy's question about academia. Uh, I was thinking more about people who actually made it in this world and see similar problems, but maybe not the root causes. Have you tried to get through to them, or what do you, what's your thinking about getting through to them? Like, say, for example, people like Elon Musk, who actually knows a lot about the problems, really tries to do something about them, but maybe not necessarily knows about all the root causes? It's a frustrating phenomenon. Elon Musk is one of the few that's kind of out of the, out of the box because he does speak about social issues and, as I mentioned, technological unemployment. But at the same time, it's troublesome because even though he's worked with Tesla and he's working on battery and storage systems that can help homes, there's still no active acknowledgement of the structural flaws. And that's my, that's my, what I look for when I, when, I mean, I, I have, I would have infinite respect for wealthy uh, folks that are doing stuff if, if they actually admit what the problem is. And that's what I tend to not see. Do you have an idea how to get through to see, them? See, I think or? it's a social psychology. Those that rise to the ranks, the rare few that have the fortune, you know, Elon Musk might be super smart, but he's lucky. Those that rise the ranks that happen to get to those points where they have millions, billions of dollars, they still have a cognitive dissonance to not want to pretend like what they have is undeserved. And I think that's really the core of the problem. Because I've spoken with folks that have you know, in, had lots of wealth that they really want to believe and they want everyone else to believe that they deserve it. Look at Bill Gates and what he's tried to do since the rise of inequality. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a positive force. It's also the largest and most powerful, undemocratic system of health reform in the world. Like, it's, it's billions and billions of dollars where there's no interest to actually ask and figure out. There's no, there's no participation. There's no democracy. And he thinks he's doing the right thing. He argues against things like economic wealth, excuse me, wealth redistribution, like Thomas Piketty, who wrote that big book. I don't know if you're familiar with it, that the wealthy 1% are continually going to be wealthy, regardless of anything the lower class does, because we don't have enough wealth to generate wealth that these folks do. So it's runaway exponential inequality, more or less from here on out, unless there's hypertaxation and so on. And G Gates argues against taxation because he says billionaires, some billionaires are better than others. Those that buy yachts and sports cars, yeah, we should look down upon them. But those of us that have these big, ridiculous foundations that ostensibly are there to improve the world, we should be omitted from that. And that's the most staggering lack of admission of how messed up the structure is. And that's why, you know, again, it's, a, it's not that you come down on them universally, but you have to, if they're not talking about the structure that's creating the poverty that the Bill and Melinda Gates is trying to solve, then what's the point? You have to, that's not solving anything. That's just trying to patch and make yourself feel better for the fact that you have all this unequal wealth. Does that make sense? I, and again, I didn't really answer your question. I don't know other than that chastisement. I think eventually there has to be a kind of shame for those that are decadent and that have this wealth. We have to stop respecting them. There, you have to stop looking at, not you guys, but the general public has to stop looking at people with Ferraris and Prada bags as anything more than a representation of the structural violence of the system and a lack of empathy. Because that's what that symbol is when people have that type of wealth. And, you know, how many private jets does Bill Gates own, you think? You know, the, the contradiction, and you see this throughout the philanthropist community, the Bonos and, the, and, the, and the, all these people that are just put up there on the high pedestal as the new philanthropists and social engineers. And, and my God, it's disappointing because none of them are actually, not even one, because I looked, <laughs> are attempting to address the root problem of the system. So I don't know. I think you have to basically kind of start being mean to these people and remove, <laughs> and remove, and remove the fact that they feel rewarded. Make them feel ashamed. These people need to be feel ashamed for their wealth, regardless of what they th they think they're doing with it. So I think this is an appropriate question coming up next. Uh, Peter Winyard, are you in the crowd there? <laughs> So, yep, back there. Peter's question is, are you concerned that, uh, like money and power, technology will be concentrated in a small elite group of people? And how can we stop it, if so? Well, let's assume we didn't have a market system. Would there be any, any incentive for people to want to have some 
mass control of a means of production. There wouldn't be as much of an incentive, and we could come up with arguments as to some kind of tyrannical, you know, uh, sci-fi thing where someone takes over and, and hacks into some central 3D printing uh, manifold, you know, city that has a 3D printing sector, which is, I think, what will eventually happen in, in terms of the types of fabrication. Uh, would that happen? There's not as much of an incentive. I could see kids doing stuff like that. But I don't, but the beauty of ephemeralization, things getting smaller and smaller and smaller, is, and of course, with the new technologies such as the blockchain and these different ways of democratizing and creating less vulnerability, less centralization, I think the more that happens, the more difficult it will be for people to, to do criminal acts against that. Plus, I think people are not inclined to destroy systems that actually support them. So if you're in a, in a society and in, in the future and you have these advanced systems that are producing for you, again, you might get a hacker that's bored. There's always going to be that kind of element. But why? Why? Why would they do it? It's not the same as in a market system where people hoard wealth because they need it for the future prosperity. They can rationalize billions, if not trillions of dollars in wealth because they can always find something new. Oh, I got to get a million dollars so I can take care of my kids. Oh, I got to get a hundred million dollars so I can reinvest in this company so I can expand and help humanity. Oh, I got to get, you know, it, they, it doesn't matter. It goes farther and farther and farther. It's a, it's a neuroses that people have, which is why, unfortunately, when you look at the psychological studies, not to change the subject, people that get more and more wealth become more and more indifferent. They become more and more greedy. It's proven sociological uh, phenomenon. Uh, they, more people in poverty donate to charity. The lower classes are far more empathic and compassionate. There's something that happens to you. And, and I think uh, that's part of the problem. So the question is, is there motivation? Coupled with the fact that with the new systems that are coming and the kind of redundancy that would be possible. See, they can't afford really good redundancy in this society. It's, you, it's, it's not affordable. But imagine if you had 25 levels of redundancy to say a server that was running a 3D, uh, a 3D industrial complex. Then if something happens, someone is aware of it and then they shift to the next redundancy. It'd be lots of fail safes that we don't have any clue about in the world today. Um, I have one about the financial system. Given that we have like tens of trillions of dollars of debt and hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivatives, how do you think this collapse will manifest? Well, it's fiction, so it doesn't have to manifest because it doesn't really exist. If it's socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor, and that goes geopolitically. So as I said, stated earlier in the presentation, the poor nations will suffer. The Argentinas, the Greeces, the Icelands, those are the ones that are victim to this. The larger powers, the ones that are producing all this debt, and selling them through their international neoliberal trade organizations, such as the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, making money out of nothing and putting whole countries in austerity. That unfolding will unfortunately continue. And that's why I mentioned the 60% going bankrupt. And the sad reality is that there's not enough money, at least in the line of thinking for people, to actually create the revisions needed to keep sustainability and to create certain levels of egalitarianism. So there's not going to be a big energy infrastructure shift in countries that literally are, are bankrupt. You know, what's happening in the global south? You know, the global south has the majority of the poverty, uh, the majority of disease, the, the lowest and declining lifespans. They, by the way, are not left behind. They're the ones that have been robbed. I want to make that very clear. Some of the oldest nations on this planet, long before Europe and or Britain, the empire, and of course America, they're rich, developing, prosperous, slowly evolving nations, and they were systemically destroyed by European expansion, expansionism and colonialism, and then the American empire, which focused mostly on the Middle East as of today, creating destabilization and ensuring, well, I'm not even gonna go into all that. But nevertheless, that lower echelon that has, literally, they're, they're way behind, way behind, they're gonna try and use industrial methods of the early 20th century for Europe and America. So they're gonna be using dirty coal methods to try and build their consumption economies. That's what China, that's why China has 16 of the world's 20th most polluted cities. They have just said, forget regulation, we are just gonna do exactly what Europe and America did and, and we don't care and we see the repercussions of what's happened there. So are these nations gonna be able to afford to, to, to apply the revisions necessary? The answer logically is no. But I'd hope that eventually some rationale would come forward and get mass debt forgiveness. I hope protest movements come forward uh, to just start wiping these debts out. In fact, jubilee, as it's called, is it happens a lot because there's more debt produced in the system than there is money. 
as I detailed in Zeitgeist Addendum. It's yeah. just like a self-generating nonsense. That's, so it, it's going to happen, the forgiveness, but the question is how much suffering will occur before people actually have the courage to stand up and you know, lock arms and make sure that their World Bank doesn't come in and start removing every single social welfare, welfare program they have and so on. So it's unfortunate. It's a dark reality. Yeah, I talk a lot about that in the past. It's in this book I just recently wrote as well, which is why you can't bank on this system as a solution. You have to transcend market dynamics if you expect to solve current problems, which, again, even more dramatically, the time continues to run out, especially on the ecological level, as we approach 500 parts per million of CO2, uh, which will be completely catastrophic. Pleasure to meet you. Great to meet the man behind the voice, because the voice is amazing. <laughs> OK, because I understand sound. sound I'm is my really own important. narrator. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm standing before you, like, like a yeah, as a total utter individualist. I'm sorry, this is a bit more statement. I'll do my best with the people that uh, what Matthew who wanted to know like empower people. Oh, yeah, everything just comes down to empowerment. I'm curious to know where the individual, like me, who is only in it for me. In the way that I'm saying it now. Well, let me ask you this, just yeah, sure. to interrupt, because I think I know what you're getting at. Okay. As an individual, what do you want? You say empowerment, but give me a little bit more detail. Okay, yeah, sure. I want to empower my life to be the most experientially rich, supportive, creative thing possible. I know that I can't do that higher than by giving what I create. I know this. But I think a lot of people miss that. And... Well, My, go ahead. Well, I, I'm trying to answer your question if I think I understand it. Go for it. So what I would say, if when you have a design economy, which is ultimately what we pitch, a collaborative design system, a system that optimizes time and efficiency and resources and energy, what it does is it creates free time for people to discover who they are, aspire to higher things, for people to actually do something outside of this labor, coercive labor, echo of slavery role that continues to to inhibit the majority of the planet. I can't think of anything more that would create empowerment, self-fulfillment, you know, internal research, uh, ability to be more social, of course, intellectual development when people actually have the time and they don't just come home angry and sit in front of TV. You know, this, this removal of the market economy would probably be the, the most empowering thing I could think of. If the value systems, of course, realign properly, which would probably take a good, a good deal of time. Uh, people are still ingrained in this idea that they work for a living. They don't really understand the difference between work and vocation. As time, as people get older, they often feel completely stripped of any sense of creative thought and any kind of aspirations for self-development or creative development. So there's a sad reality to what this system is doing to people. But I, to answer your question, I think empowerment will come from freeing man from the drudgery that this system continues to compound. I just think, I'm just saying that I think you could drive that better by explaining the excellence of what you make than um, just... Say that the, again, I'm sorry? Uh, I think it would be better if people resonated with the excellence that what would be created from that foundation I, I than, think we're than on the, the same morals. page. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying as a total, utter, in the, you know, egocentric <laughs> swear word. Well, I don't think you're egocentric that egocentric person. You're here, no, I totally agree with you. If you're I'm here, you can't be that egocentric. So you oh, have, yeah. Get in line. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I have uh, it's basically one question in two parts. One is, uh, I'm wondering how you understand spirituality. That's part A. And part B, I'm wondering whether you think, does that have anything to contribute to this hopefully better future? I would define spiritu spirituality as relating to something larger than the self. And that doesn't necessarily mean on the external. It could also be internal about discovering things, and that's why, you know, things like meditation and balance and, you know, starting to understand your body and your nervous system. I'm very technical with it. Yep. You know, if I was, uh, as I mentioned, Martin Luther King, poverty of the spirit, to me it's more of a value system disorder. Mm -hmm. I think about it more of a cause and effect, because I think spirituality in those terms get lost in meaning. Sure. I think the greatest spiritual awakening will happen when we see that we have to respect each other and the planet. What we've been yearning for, for eons is that final revelation that, yeah, we all share the same environment. We are all effectively the same. As Carl Sagan said, we're all stardust. And that's, a, and that's, not, a, that's not a metaphysical concept. Mm -hmm. We actually are all stardust. So we're all, it's all inside of you, so to speak. And you can, you know, 
you can think about that in whatever level of depth that you wish. But I think coexistence with nature and each other will be the highest spiritual state we can achieve. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Lucky last, I hope. Good morning and thank you, Peter, on behalf of all of us and the other 7 billion people oh, for well. choosing this path. I, <laughs> I'll again, be writing lots of letters. And yeah, well, all of your work has changed my life. So I'm going to end with, well, start with a, a quote from my, my hero, which is Einstein, and he said, no, no problem is solved from the same consciousness or, or level of thinking that's created it, which is why I think what you've done and what the Zeitgeist movement in general does is honour that. I, I see it changing the level of consciousness. Good. And working within that evolutionary change, I'm also being very practical. And I'm reading stuff around um, the real limits that the planet is hitting in terms of our occupation. And one of my other favourite authors, apart from you, is James Howard Kunstler, who wrote The Long Emergency, among others. Okay. And in it, he's asked, why is it when you have these kind of wonderful people who've got new ideas, they generally get... Uh, called doomers or preppers or apocalyptists or technical geeks or whatever. Why does that happen? And his answer was, well, um, most people in the world are fed a diet of needing to feel good instead of being given a reality check. And what I'd like to do is ask you whether the Zeitgeist movement needs a reality check too, because in his book, um, Kunstler says, we can't continue into the future because there's not enough um, trapped sunlight. He said, in the 50s, it cost $400,000 to put down one oil well that would gush under its own pressure for 30 years and deliver thousands of barrels of oil a day. Fast forward to now, it costs $10 million to put down one oil well, won't come up under its own pressure, delivers hundreds of barrels, etc., and is gone in three years. So if that is the, the joining of the dots that we as homo sapiens are working with, does the zeitgeist movement represent too much magical thinking? That's a great question, because I think that's been a long-standing criticism that, that it's, again, you could probably use that word, utopian. And it's unfortunate that the design revelation isn't as apparent. Going to your hydrocarbon question, the conventionals have been going scarce. But what did these corporations do? They used technology for the wrong purposes uh, at the great risk of climate disaster, and they decided to go to unconventionals. And I point that up because they have created, at least at this point in time, an abundance of hydrocarbon energy through these dramatically awful and highly polluting, massive externalities, probably not even profitable, as I said before, because at the current state of the planet, nothing's profitable because we're so inefficient in what we're doing. But they were able to succeed with something that no one thought they could, because I studied the peak oil community for a long time. And conventional peak oil is absolutely true. But with the advent of new technology, they were to milk even more. And there actually probably is even more oil and unique and weird and fairly weak, but they can still pull it out and they subsidize it and they can maintain their energy monopoly. That's a testament really to ephemeralization. What I didn't explain, it just dawned on me, in that chart where I had the eight trends that go up, there was a squiggly little line. And that line represents the natural efficiency that continues to be produced what we call Moore's Law or, or uh, zero marginal cost in the words of, words of Jeremy Rifkin. We're doing more and more and more with less and less and less. And I think with, from an arithmetic standpoint, someone would say, well, you have this number of people on the planet, they consume X number of resources. We can only assume if we doubled the population, then we'd have to double the resources. That's actually not true. And that's, that's what underpins the entire movement's logic. As time moves forward, we do more and more and more with less and less and less. It's not arithmetic anymore. It's exponentially diminishing in terms of what's required. And that is absolutely profound and what actually debunks a lot of these, these doomsayers, because I've known quite a few of them, uh, folks that really thought the end was coming. They could, and on paper it looked right, but they didn't expect that natural efficiency. And what the RBE, whatever you want to call it, what it is proposing is you remove this inhibition of the market, you focus only on the, the design science, and you magnify the ephemeralization more with less phenomenon. And if you do that deliberately, then you enter into an entirely different sphere where your people are existing with amazing abundance potentials, but the impact is so low that it's actually not inhibiting or creating more scarcity because we're able to have a regenerative type of phenomenon. Buckminster Fuller was big on that. He did all these, quant these calculations about how we live in a regenerative environment. And if we can just tap into that along with ephemeralization, of course, with a little bit of a value change, you can't have the materialistic conception. You know, the reason 
people have this scarcity worldview is that they try to rationalize that, well, not everyone can have two jets parked in the front lawn, a 50-room mansion, 50 sports cars. That's really the final defense right now in this elitist society of why people don't think abundance is possible. They don't think this post-scarcity is impossible. And that is a complete neurosis. So you, you can't think that way. It's all about public health. And I really think that will subside as time goes forward as far as this materialistic mental illness, which has been culminated once again in the social psychology by the market, you know, as I had in that chart. So once you remove that structuralism, you start to diminish people. I mean, think about it. The millennials I've heard recently, because of their awareness of, of what's happening in the world, and they're, they're apparently slightly more caring, they're actually far more minimalistic now. They don't want to have a lot of property. Like imagine in the future, and this is a hypothetical, not having any property at all. Rather you have access to everything depending on where you go because the society has been engineered to allow for that. To me, that's the biggest abundance ever. I have, I have tons of film equipment that I don't need to have all the time. And I can't afford to rent all of it because it, I lose in the end, so I have to invest in it. And I hate that because I have to have storage, I have to have all this stuff, it's a nightmare to move. So if I had access to it, and everyone else had access to it, and you had this design concept, and you appreciated the more with less phenomenon, it's almost mind-numbing what we can have access to without creating a massive ecological footprint. So to answer your question, ultimately, it's really an outdated kind of perception. Until people realize you know, that, that we can do a great deal, and when nanoscience comes forward, and when certain replacements of certain things that we have depleted do come forward to replace rare earth metals and things like that, which will happen, then, then that will, be, again, uh, affect the trend more positively. So I do not agree, uh, even though I clearly show the limits of what we're doing uh, in that chart, that doesn't mean to say that that's the way it has to be, obviously, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't be talking about it. I recommend Buckminster Fuller if you want to read more about the core of that logic, because he probably did the absolute best job and actually did qualifications back in the 1950s based on raw materials. So it's a, it's a good read. It's called Critical Path. Thank you all.